Great. Okay, uh, my name is Nabi. I'm a painter and uh, I'm just going to talk about how I kind of got to where I am in terms of what I make paintings about. Um, and I'm going to go right back to the, the beginning. So um, some of you might know that uh, Joe and I did our degree together. Uh, that gives us a, give you, gives you all an idea of uh, when <laughs> and how old we are. Um, so this goes back to right, uh, right back at the beginning of my BA, which I did at Northumbria University. Um, and I'm from Hartlepool originally, and I moved up to Newcastle to do my, my degree. And I think uh, as soon as you uh, move away from a, a town, you, you find it more interesting in some ways. And, and this is kind of, I'm, I'm what, 19 or something when you do your degree. So you're kind of finding out who you are to, to a degree. Um, and I didn't know what I was doing. You know, you, you, you don't, you've just started a, a degree. How are you supposed to know? I started making these little paintings that were on pieces of board that I'd, um, that I'd found in the, in the streets. Um, this is back at home uh, in Hartlepool. Um, this is uh, down the street from uh, my mum's house. Uh, that was a kind of betting shop around the corner there. That was the library. And this bit of board, I think it had been torn down from a, a lamppost or something. You know, when you get um, when you get pieces of board that have planning notices or things like that on. Um, oh, sorry. Um, and I, oh, oh dear, sorry. <laughs> um, I found this piece of board laying just where that was. I thought it'd be a really nice idea to make a painting of the the um, site exactly what I saw when I could. Um, when I found the, the piece of board. There was no kind of deeper thoughts about it um, at, at that stage, but there was something really nice and fitting, I thought, about having um, the an image that absolutely belonged to the thing that it was um, painted on. And this is very small, it's about A4, so depending on how you're viewing this, maybe about the size that you're seeing it. Um, I decided to make some paintings that um, were about Hartlepool and there's a, an arterial bus route in Hartlepool that goes from one end of the town through the town centre to the other. Um, and I found myself on this bus route a lot. And I, I found myself coming back to this theme as the years went, uh, went on. Um, I didn't really have, uh, I didn't really know why at this point. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of 20 here, 1920, and just trying to find my way and learn how to paint, I guess. Um, these are all, again, quite small. Um, I think I painted that because of the slogan. I thought it'd be funny to see that in a painting. Um, but I was on that bus uh, that you can see reflected in the window. So it was a kind of uh, uh, a challenge for myself as well. How do I paint that kind of re reflection um, in, a, um, in a reasonably believable way? Again, quite small. This is probably about, uh, I don't know, 25 centimeters by um, 15 or 20. Um, this was, this is slightly out of sequence, actually. This came later. Um, this is in um, in Newcastle, uh, near near Shields Road, actually. Um, and again, it was the I liked the the history that was evident in that um, in that image, the way that that sticker on the window had been scratched away from the back. And I, again, also a, a little challenge for myself: how do I paint that reflection um, in a in a believable way? This is the first painting that I made um, that felt like there was a reason behind it. So I, I think I'd always um, had the, the this thing that I kind of, I call it a, a luxurious problem. So I can paint and draw pretty well. So that is kind of intimidating. I could potentially then make a half decent painting or drawing of just about anything. Um, so how do you decide what to do? And for me, that has always brought with it um, the idea of restrictions or the idea of um, something to help you make decisions. Um, so at this point, just a little bit of content warning here, I'm going to talk a lot about, um, about uh, bereavement. Um, not so much, there won't be anything visual, but I am going to talk about bereavement and grief. Um, and later on, um, there will be other themes that I'll, I'll flag before I talk about them. Um, so when I made this painting, again, it was a painterly 
decision um, that informed it and a humorous decision. I thought it was really hilarious. This is my mum's uh, front room. And I thought it was really hilarious that she had this grand Louis XIV um, plaster fire surround with a council gas fire in the middle of it. Um, and on a painterly level, I thought, well, how do I make that that fire look hot? How do I make the, the bars of the fire look hot? Um, so it, it all came down to these decisions of using color straight from the tubes. So that was like cadmium yellow right in the middle and cadmium red right at the top and titanium white, um, again, undiluted on the, um, on the right hand side of the painting. Um, so around this time was when both of my grandparents died and we were clear in the house. I was going home a lot more. Um, and my, my granddad had been in hospital for a few, maybe over a month, like maybe two months uh, before he passed away. And we had to clear the house and I made a series of paintings that, that were um, what we found in the house basically. Uh, and what was left behind. So this was quite small. This is probably about uh, 15 inches square. These slides aren't very good because they're Again, an indicator of how old I am. They're from actual 35 millimeter slides that have been scanned in and I don't have the original paintings anymore. This kind of uh, does rather look like my uh, granddad took heroin. He didn't, he just had a yogurt. That's what the spoons are doing, I think. Um, yeah, so his TV um, unplugged, that kind of dust on the screen. Um, I see that one very much as a kind of portrait of my granddad, but without him, without him in it, his suit jacket that he always wore. The design of that quick save carrier bag probably dates this quite a lot. So this paintings from about 2000, 2001. Um, I'm going through these quite quickly, I'm aware. Um, there's gonna be, I'm gonna slow down when I get closer to what my work turned out to be. Uh, again, same series of paintings. I'm just going to quickly go through those. Um, this one uh, was became quite an important painting um, in terms of my approach to making work later on, and I didn't realize it at the time. So my approach to painting on a technical level, as you can, as you've seen, is kind of it's influenced by uh, photorealism. It they, it isn't photoreal by any means. The paintings are quite loose if you see them in the flesh, but they uh, recognizably um, they recognizably belong to a photographic kind of vision. Um, and so I'm, this is kind of last year of university and my technique had developed to a stage where I would always uh, make uh, an underpainting in acrylic just to get rid of the white primer. And then I'd build up more and more, and more layers of the painting um, with acrylic. And then I would do the last coat on the on the paint in the final details in really nice high quality um, artist oil paint um, so that red for instance that's like um, probably about 30 pound tube of paint um, that I would only use pin pricks from but it had that real kind of punch um, so yeah paint was expensive and I was skint um, and I was I remember making this painting and real I was getting ready to paint the sky um, and the sky is white, as you can see, in that kind of um, the type of white that you get with bad quality photography generally. Um, and I was getting ready to squeeze out probably about three or four pounds worth of titanium white oil paint to paint that uh, sky, um, which is which was just the, the white of the primer. And then I just suddenly had a kind of light bulb moment. I thought, why am I doing that? It's already white. So I'm just going to leave it. It, it. it felt like it would have been an unnecessary act just to smear, to put a coat of oil paint on there, it did enough. And that um, sense of economy has kind of driven how my painting technique has uh, developed. Um, so these paintings are all from um, that number six bus route that I talked about. I decided to, um, to take, I can't remember the number, but it was something like 10, um, photographs in order to make 10 paintings from this uh, from this journey. And the ideas of journeys it became really important to me as, as time went on. Um, this one, uh, 
I thought, I suppose I was a little bit disillusioned with um, art. <laughs> this this theme will come back uh, throughout the talk. And I thought, what is the dumbest thing I can do? I'm going to paint a bin. I'm going to I'm going to make this painting of a bin, and it's going to hang in a in a gallery, um, and people are going to have to look at the bin that was outside the newsagent where I ate my chips at school. Um, so I did. And uh, but I'm going to paint the bin. I thought really really well, so people are having to pay attention to this painting of a bin. So there's a kind of like I don't know a bit of a two fingers attitude um, at that point. The wilderness years. So when I finished um, my degree. I had a little bit of um, of interest, and I did a thing called the Graduate Fellowship at Northumbria, where they gave me a free studio and I taught life drawing to pay for it. But again, I was really, really skint, and I I really didn't enjoy painting very much um, at that point because I was trying to pay my rent. Um, there was no support for this fellowship thing. It was um, just this this studio. And it wasn't open late, so it had to, it changed the type of work that I could do because I had to be in the studio in nine to five hours. Um, so these little paintings are um, they're, uh, 12 by 10 inches. Um, and they're that size because I taught a workshop to some students on how to stretch canvases. And there was a load of the canvases left over. Um, so I took them. And that pragmatism, um, absolutely drives um, my approach to, to making work. Uh, these are again all from this um, walk in Hartlepool. Um, about that point I didn't make any paintings for about two years. Um, I started working in an art shop in, uh, in Newcastle, uh, Newcastle Art Centre and I started playing in bands and putting on gigs and I because I was working um, at this art shop the last thing I wanted to do uh, with my uh, non-work time was to get out paint and I, I just got really disillusioned with it and uh, yeah didn't make any work for about two years. Um, I think this painting and this painting um, I did um, over that like kind of they were on the on the bedroom wall and I was tinkering with them for about two years um, so I, I'm exaggerating when I said I didn't make any paint for two years I made these two and that was it. Um, I was living in Heaton in Newcastle at the time, not far from Chili Studios. And uh, this, I lived in about three different houses on Falmouth Road, uh, which runs between Heaton Park Road and Heaton Road. And on the side of the newsagent there, a corner shop, there was this chalkboard that said special offer. And in the three years that I lived on that street, there was never once a special offer on that board. Um, yeah. Uh, this painting, uh, was the was the final part of my um, again this is slightly out of sequence. This is um, the final exhibition for the graduate fellowship that I did. Um, this is the basement of what was the Weirgood Gallery and is now Bal Baltic Thirty Nine. Um, and this painting was shown in that room um, on that pillar in the background. So when you saw it, you saw what you were looking at. Um, and that approach uh, to making work about about sites and about specific locations um, became very important as well, I think it's already been important, but it's, it's stayed really important to me. Um, this painting, the idea of showing it in that gallery was completely ripping off an artist called Andrew Grassi, who, um, who paints the gallery that he's about to show in. Um, and yeah, I admit that. Um, so yeah, I didn't make any work uh, until uh, 2008 when I did my MFA at Newcastle University and I'd had a I was always engaged with the art scene um, I was always going to previews and you know lots of my friends are artists um, and seeing exhibitions and I think I saw a particularly bad exhibition one night and I thought oh, I've got to get back into it I can do much better than this um, so I applied for the MFA um, at Newcastle University, the Master of Fine Art uh, course, um, whilst drunk in the middle of the night, I think, and uh, I was lucky enough to get an interview and get in. Um, so a big shift happens here um, in terms of material. Previous to this, I've been working in oil on canvas and with that acrylic underpainting that I, that I talked about. And 
it felt increasingly, even when I was making that other work, that um, the choice of using oil paint for the final stages of the paintings was a little bit tokenistic, like a little bit unnecessary. It felt like um, in order to, it felt like the implication was in order for something, a painting to be considered art, whatever that is, it needed to be an oil paint on canvas rather than acrylic. And um, I don't agree with that at all. It became this tokenistic act. Um, so I decided to completely shift to acrylic. Um, the logic as well as that that I've just talked about was that it, may, it dries quicker. Oil paint can take many, many months, um, sometimes even years to dry. And acrylic takes at most overnight, even if you put it on very thick. So I thought whilst I was learning to paint again, I guess, um, I could get a quicker turnover of work done. Um, but then I had that problem again. What do I paint? Um, that problem that never really went away. And I thought of a different um, set of restrictions to give myself. So at this stage, I'm about uh, I'm about 30. And that, I think it's a kind of a milestone age. You kind of look back and you think, oh, right, okay, I'm 30 now. How did that happen? Um, now I'm 41 and I think, oh, <laughs> you were so young. Anyway, uh, I was about 30 and I was like, I, was, I started this process of re-examination of, um, of who I was, I guess, and what it meant for me to be English, what it meant for me to be a mixed race guy, what it meant to be turning 30. Um, and I decided to make paintings about the country, I guess, um, in a very loose way. Um, and I, I wanted to travel and, and kind of see parts of the country that I, I wouldn't have um, necessarily had course to go to. So I thought of the work of a group of artists called the Boyle family. Um, and the, if anyone knows their work, what they, they did, um, it started with uh, just the, uh, the parents, who we'll call Mr. and Mrs. Boyle, um, in the 60s, uh, they were based in Glasgow. And they had a, a practice and a process whereby they would throw a dart in a map they would travel to the exact spot where the dart landed and they would make a cast of the ground wherever the, um, the dart had landed. Um, they would take this cast back to the studio um, and they would paint it um, very illusionistically in, um, in, in oil paint. And then this three-dimensional relief cast would be shown like a painting is shown uh, um, up, on a, up on a wall. And I thought, I was thinking a lot about that process and how I could use a similar process. And I thought about how would it work if I did a similar thing. She also said with the, the Boyle family, they started off in uh, with a map of Glasgow and then they ended up doing this kind of map of the world as they got um, more and more successful. And sometimes the, um, quite frequently actually, the, um, the map would, uh, the, sorry, the, the dart would land in really exotic places on the map sure that was coincidence. Um, so I thought, how, how could I co-opt that, um, that process? How could I do something similar? And I thought if I did, I don't drive. Um, so I thought if I did something similar, what would I do if a, a dart lands in a map? I'd probably get the, the train or, or the bus to um, the middle of that town. Um, I'd arrive there and I'd, I'd, I'd kind of find myself with sort of a, a, a pointless wonder in a place that I didn't know. And I would think, what would I actually do? I'd probably end up with paintings of um, train stations, bus stations and pubs. So I thought that wasn't, wasn't gonna work. So I decided to make visits to stay with friends. Um, when you live in a, a town, um, you very seldom and very rarely live in the center of the town, usually because it's cheaper to live out you know, in the outskirts. So I decided to stay with with um, friends who I'd never visited. And I would go to their house, um, sorry, go to their town by public transport. I'd meet them in the evening, do whatever they were doing that evening, go and stay with them at their house, again, out somewhere, um, and then go with them to work the next morning, leave them at work, find my own way out and go to the next town. And I did that for about a month. Um, and I, yeah, and during that procedure, I gave myself a number of photographs to take to make paintings from. 
it, I can't remember the number, it might have been 10, it might have been 20, just as possibilities. Um, and this was a way to kind of get myself out of my own tastes, I guess. Um, there were certain things that I naturally kind of attracted to. Um, I, I like, you know, I'm interested in the, the everyday and the slightly overlooked, uh, maybe a slightly rundown type things, type imagery. And I decided, how do I, how do I change that up? So this was a process to try and change that up. Um, so some of these, these next uh, tranche of paintings are, are some of that work. Um, I was attracted to this image that's on screen, um, largely because of that horrible green. Uh, and I thought, how do I get that horrible green to work against that red? Um, I mentioned um, photorealism earlier on, um, a lot of 60s and 70s American photorealism showed gumball machines. So we have the, those gumball machines there and they're almost like a little nod to that, um, that part of art history. Um, this one looks quite flat. That blue looks really flat in the background. So this is um, painted boards that are around a building site somewhere in London. Um, if you see this painting in the flesh, um, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of um, very, very transparent layers of blue um, that make up that color. So it operates in, in quite a particular way when you see it in the flesh. And um, again, on that technical level, you've got that orange of the, the light next to it. And those are colors from opposite sides of the color wheel. So they, they have that resonance, that kind of visual um, dissonance that happens. Similar thing with that, this kind of um, orange and green or red and green. Um, when I, I think it was the symmetry of, of this image that, uh, as well as that, as that color combination that attracted me to it. And it was also about giving myself a, a challenge. Um, I thought, how do I, how do I go about painting that grass? And uh, the the answer is slowly. Um, this painting, um, what looks like grey at the top of the screen, um, isn't. That's um, it's ultramarine blue, so a very similar colour to that. Um, that straight from the tube painted on there and then it has many 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 layers of transparent um, whites and grays that go over the top of it in order to give it a different kind of um, visual sensation um, so it looks quite odd uh, when you see it in the flesh and the yellow on the bottom half um, so it looks wonky um, and that's because it is um, I, I wanted there to be this slightly disorientating feeling um, in it and that yellow um, has got lots and lots of different things going on. It's got lots of drips. It's got thick paint, thin paint, shiny bits, matte bits, um, cracked bits, scratched bits. Um, so what looks like a, a straight representational image, I really want to make the paint work in quite an abstract way. Um, I've sometimes said in the past, that I'm, I feel like an abstract painter stuck in a representational painter's body. Um, so I'm trying to push how I'm applying paint here, I guess. I, I want the image to be um, recognizably representational, but still have some of the same qualities that an abstract painting might have. So I made very deliberate decisions to leave drips visible in this one, for instance. This is uh, on the South Bank in London. Uh, this one is in Bolton, uh, around the back of uh, where my mother-in-law used to live um, and there was a quite a strange thing with this um, this space that was around the back um, it was fenced in on all four sides and no one really seemed to know what happened in there um, this is another one in Bolton this is quite big this is four foot by five foot and this was like a little joke about um, abstract expressionism uh, for me um, so the, uh, the flat panel on the, um, on the right of the screen, that is spray paint and incredibly flat, mechanically flat. Um, and on the other side is not, it's just a, it's acrylic, um, lots of different layers and drips and scratches and whatnot. And it felt like a joke about Barnett Newman on the right and Mark Rothko on the left. Jokes may be too strong a word. Um, this painting again is quite big, three foot, uh, sorry, uh, five foot by four foot. Um, this is in, um, the site is in Barcelona. So there's quite a lot going on with this. I, I thought I, what's a deceptively simple image. 
Um, it's the side of a metro platform in Barcelona. And I wanted to strip out as much of that representational stuff as I could and still have it hang together as a representational image. So what looks like black in the background there is dozens and dozens of alternating layers of uh, ultra, uh, sorry, of um, viridian or phthalo green and alizarin crimson. And they cancel each other out and you get this kind of rich chromatic dark. So chromatic as in kind of with color. Um, the gray underneath that is spray paint, so mechanically flat. Um, and that red stripe on the left-hand side is really, really thick, shiny paint. Um, and you might be able to see that horizontal darker stripe um, just at the beginning, at the, sorry, at the bottom of the, of the dark area. Um, that was like a pipe or something that was um, in the background, but that is one drip of varnish that I just allowed to run and dry. Um, this painting lives in a, a restaurant in a little village north of Milan now that I could never afford to eat at. Um, this painting became quite important later on. Um, so you remember the, uh, the bus stop painting with the white um, sky? Um, I was thinking very much about that painting when I was, when I was making this work. So this painting, um, the horizon, line is mathematically in the center of the composition. And again, making a little joke to myself, I thought it would be really quite funny if I painted half the painting. So that white that you can see at the top, that's just the white of the prime canvas. There's no paint on that whatsoever. And then if that painting sold, the person who bought it would be buying half a painting. Um, you've got to get your kicks where you can. Um, Okay, so now um, this is the end of my MFA. Um, I had this painting, by the way, got into the John Moore's Painting Prize in 2010. And that was kind of very much the, the end of my MFA and the beginning of, um, of me being a professional artist, I guess. Um, so now um, from here on in, um, there's not gonna be I'm not going to be talking about explicitly um, dark things, um, but there are themes of murder, suicide, uh, grief. Um, yeah, there won't be any imagery that, that specifically relates to that, but all of these paintings have, um, most of these paintings have a, a dark history, and that's the reason that I've chosen the site. Can I just so say, if you want to oh yeah yeah no be, uh, you're probably just about to say the same though sorry to interrupt yeah um if if you want to kind of pop and get a cuppa um if you if you prefer to miss this part um and maybe come back in i don't know how many um well there's probably going to be dark stuff for a lot of the rest of the talk the last 10 minutes maybe but i'm not sure when that will start so maybe if you wanted to get a cuppa you could um uh, watch the recording i don't know Okay. Thank you. Right, this painting, um, I didn't really know it at the time, um, but this became quite important with the, um, the choices of, that I would make in, in making paintings. So this is big again, this is um, uh, five foot by four foot. Um, if you ever see this in the flesh, actually you, you'll never see this in the flesh unless you're my mate Gary, you know, and you go around my mate Gary's house, so yeah. Um, the dark area um, of the reflection is in enamel. So it's really, really shiny, um, which kind of disrupts the, the surface when you, when you see it in the flesh. Um, and the top bit, um, it's not a particularly good slide, the top bit where that gravel is, is lots and lots of very individually applied um, dots. So lots happens if you, if you ever see it in the flesh. Yeah, I'll invite you around Gary's house. Um, so I took this, uh, photograph of this painting, um, largely because I really like the shapes in it. And uh, we were, this is in a place called Buxworth or Bugsworth in Derbyshire. Um, it's a canal basin, like a turning point for a canal. And uh, we were out for a drive with my mother-in-law and her uh, and uh, her husband. And um, we went for um, dinner in a in a pub um, that was owned by this person. Um, this is an age test, who knows who this is? So uh, this is uh, Pat Phoenix um, from Coronation Street. Uh, and 
it turned out that she owned, she owned the pub where this was um, where this was directly outside. And I was trying to tell someone that we'd been where we'd been for this uh, meal. And I, I Googled it and looked it up. And it turned out that this was actually the site where in the 19th century, late 19th century, the last man to be hung in the historical county of Derbyshire murdered his wife. Um, so it had this double layer of, of kind of history to it. Um, and that, yeah, there's no indication um, in, the, in the paintings that that's what happens, but this kind of sparked off an interest in me with the history that's present everywhere and how our understanding of historical events affects our uh, feelings about sites, uh, feelings about um, landscape um, and how that can be processed through painting. Um, and this had been sort of an idea that percolated in my head since I was a teenager. And I remember watching um, Billy Connolly's World Tour of Scotland uh, when that was on in 92 or 93 or something. And he was in Culloden um, and talking about the, the massacre that happened there in the, you know, the Battle of Culloden. And he was like, it was around here that all these English people slaughtered us and all this business. And um, the, but it was just a field. And that kind of idea, I think I can trace it back to that point of this kind of idea of how our understanding and knowledge, um, moreover, of, um, of, of historical sites or, or even everyday sites changes when we know what's happened there. Um, so this is a part of a series of five paintings um, that were chosen very specifically. So these are the sites where the victims of Jack the Ripper uh, were found in uh, in London and in, in the London's East End in 1888, as they are now, or rather as they were about 10 years ago. Um, and London changes so quickly that there are now three of these sites that you can't stand on anymore. Um, there's a building over the top of this one now. Um, these uh, paintings, I should say, are very, very specifically um, located. So. Um, to within about a foot of the center of the painting is where the victim was found. Um, so again, this is linked to that idea of me not wanting to choose what I'm making paintings of. I choose the event, I find exactly where it happened um, and have to make a painting of whatever I find there. And th sometimes that's really hard. So this is a particular example of one that was really hard. Like I found that, I thought I really don't want to make a painting of that, but I kind of had to because it was part of this process. Um, so yeah, you can't stand there. This one is in uh, the old Truman Brewery. Um, there used to be a, it used to be a backyard of 29 Hanbury Street, but it's um, it's now a car park for most of the time. But it's also where they have the, the kind of cool hipster market on a Sunday. Um, this one is actually a school now. Um, this one is around the back of the gherkin and a, there's like a, a little coffee shop and it's like a little quiet courtyard called Mitre Court uh, where lots of office workers sit and have their sandwiches, presumably not knowing what's happened there. This is also a school as well. Uh, this one you can't stand on anymore. Um, there's a building over the top of it. Um, and this one was a prize winner in the 2012 uh, John Moore's Painting Prize. Um, this was a, a site that was quite specifically uh, located. It was also quite an important painting with it being a prize winner in that painting prize. It really raised my, my profile a little bit. Uh, but you've got that, we've got a gap in the curbstones there. And that gap um, was the gap that uh, led down there to Miller's Court. So where the, the murder happened was probably about 15 feet behind that wall, but that was a market stock room. So I couldn't get, that was the closest that I could get. Um, this painting and, oh, this painting um, shows this site. Um, this is part of a, a diptych um, that was made in uh, 2016. Um, for the 20th anniversary of the IRA bombing in Manchester. And it was shown at Paper Gallery in Manchester, just around the corner from 
um, where the bombing happened. Um, so this, the bench on that uh, painting is where that truck was parked. Um, the post box there was the only thing left standing in the blast radius. Um, there it is. Um, so this is in Market Street in Manchester. And I, I go to Manchester quite a lot. Um, and I started going to Manchester um, you know, when I was a teenager to see gigs and things like that. And I um, went back once and found myself getting lost. And I didn't really, couldn't figure out where, um, where I was going and I couldn't figure out why. And I realized it was because that had happened and you know the center of Manchester had been absolutely blown apart. So the literal footprint, footprint of, the, of the buildings was different, um, which I found really kind of interesting in uh, recreating that schema. Um, so I'm, again, I'm going quite quickly here. This is a place in uh, Norwich called Lollard's Pit. Um, it's where it's now like a really quaint, uh, really pretty uh, boating river, but it used to be a pit where they would carry out um, religious persecution. This is um, in Havana in Cuba. This is the closest point on the coast on the Malacan to America. So this is where lots of um, rafts um, of people trying to um, escape Cuba um, have, have launched from, although why you'd want to escape, it's great Cuba. <laughs> um, this is a painting of a site where something didn't happen. Um, so this painting is, um, I'm sure a lot of you know the story of the, the Lambton worm. Um, it's a local Northeast folk story uh, where a rich landowner's son um, goes fishing in the River Weir and he, uh, he catches a fish upon his hook, he felt like mighty queer. Um, and the, uh, he catches this neat like creature, throws it down a well, goes off to fight in the first crusade. In his absence, it grows into a dragon. Um, when he comes back, a humbled man, he, um, he slays the dragon. That's a potted history if you look into it more. Um, yeah, I'm sure a lot of you know it, but yeah, it kind of constricted. That's why he's got spikes on his armor. Um, and it tends to be linked with Penshaw Monument uh, in Sunderland or just outside Sunderland near Washington um, because of ridges on the, the side of the hill where it's um, said that the, the dragon wound itself around. But that link only actually happened in the 19th century through a folk song, um, so, so a musical song. Um, on the other side of the river in a place called Fatfield um, is uh, Worm Hill Terrace. And then you've got Worm Hill um, on Worm Hill Terrace. And on top of it, you've got Worm Well, which is this. It's a bit of scrubland now. Uh, and really interesting to make a painting of a site where something didn't happen. Um, so, you know, the, that dragon <laughs> probably didn't happen. If you look at the, um, the land topographically, Fatfield is a, a farming, sorry, a mining uh, village. And that's almost definitely a, a slag heap. Um, I mentioned earlier, I'm from Hartlepool, uh, where famous for hanging a monkey um, because we thought it was a, a French spy in the Napoleonic Wars. Apart from we didn't, it's a complete myth. There's no historical evidence for it whatsoever. And um, it actually, the story probably um, originates in a place called Bodham near Aberdeen. There was a, a guy called Ned Corvin, who was a, a, a traveling um, music hall singer in the 19th century. And he would kind of rib the town he was appearing in. And he decided to link it with Hartlepool. And uh, my ancestors really went with it. So this is uh, the, the only, um, the only indication of any type of geographical specificity with the story is that it was hung on the fish sands. So this is the fish sands, which is quite a small area. Um, and so this is a painting of the site where we didn't hang the monkey. Um, little trigger warning here. Um, I was really badly beaten up here and here um, in Hartlepool. Um, if you Google me and hit videos, I made a short film about the, the making of these paintings for the Contemporary Visual Arts Network. Um, and you can see how I approach making a painting. So there's, um, on the path area here, 
there's a lot of really bright pink underneath. So you can see these kind of colors going down um, and how they, how they operate. Um, this is um, where the um, record producer, Joe Meek lived, worked and died. Um, he uh, was really badly uh, repressed and ripped off. Uh, he was a gay man in the sixties and he was hounded by the press and um, shot himself and his landlady. Um, things aren't, uh, all the subject matter isn't dark. So this is, um, this kind of looks like it could be a murder scene, doesn't it? Um, this is it and it kind of looks like it's in New York, but it's not, it's in London. It's around the back of the Savoy Hotel. And for any Bob Dylan fans, it's where the video for Subterranean Homesick Blues was filmed. Um, yeah, just exactly there. Um, one for any uh, indie fans of a certain age. Uh, this is a Salford Lads Club, which is an interesting place in its own right in terms of working class education, uh, but it's also um, famous for being uh, where the Smiths um, filmed videos and had uh, their um, feature on the inside cover of the Queen is Dead record. This is another age test. So this painting again became quite um, important later on, and I didn't know it at the time. Um, this is called Untitled Yard Painting Halbert, um, and it's where the gates met to Steptoe's yard in the TV series, the iconic groundbreaking uh, sitcom. Uh, they made uh, some TV films for, uh, about 10 years later in the early 70s, and they used a different location, um, and that is the site where the gates are now. And I found that very specifically through this scene in the second film, which is called Step the Unsun Yard uh, Ride Again. Um, if you see, if you can see the, um, the windows and doors on that building um, that we can see through the gate, you can see the same buildings and uh, is still standing there reflected in my painting. So I was able to pace it out um, very specifically to get exactly where it is. So yeah, still painting reflections, that was really difficult. Um, this painting, the first one, um, this won the Contemporary British Painting Prize in 2017. And it, I mentioned earlier this kind of idea of layers of history. Um, so for all of these sites that I've shown and for any site, um, there's, we focus on one particular part of its history. Um, but they're innumerable different things. Um, so as many, you know, I said that one of those Jack the Ripper sites was also a, a place where people have their sandwiches, one's a schoolyard. Um, it was that one thing that we attribute um, importance to for you know, a blink of an eye and then it was gone. Um, that became quite prescient with this painting. So this is underneath the Westway flyover near uh, Ladbroke Grove in London. And um, I, I took that painting on quite a, the, the photograph on which this painting is based on quite a bright day and the sun is in my eyes. Um, and I was kind of walking up and down this little street, which is called Stable Way, um, to find this spot. It took a little while of walking to find exactly where I was looking for. And it turned out, I was, the sun was in my eyes and I was shading it with a, with a tower block in the, in the background. Um, and it was only a couple of years, not maybe a year or two after I'd made this painting that um, I realized that that tower block was Grenfell. Um, so this painting just took on another layer of, um, of interest, I guess. Again, going quite quickly, um, this is in Harrogate at the Old Swan Hotel. Um, this is where Agatha Christie, um, the novelist, uh, went missing. Her husband was cheating on her with the the governess, and uh, she she sort of faked her own death. She left her her car and her gloves and all her possessions um, at the this local uh, suicide spot, and she got the train to Harrogate. Checked in under an assumed name that was the name of um, one of the names was the name of the mistress, and uh, there was this huge nationwide manhunt for her, um, and she was staying in that room. Um, this is in uh, Venice, so this is between those two poles. It's usually that uh, busy. Um, this is this really, you know, um, busy tourist site near the Grand Canal. 
but it's also where they used to carry out uh, executions in the um, medieval times. This is a little bit of a two for one. So this is um, where David Bowie's right foot was um, exactly for that album cover. But this photograph was the photograph from which the painting's based was taken the week after he died, where it became this makeshift shrine. Much to the annoyance of the design studio that uh, his doorway is just beyond all that stuff. Um, this is a local one, um, the card bar on, uh, I forgot what street it's on, uh, just off Westgate Road anyway. Um, it was, it's kind of a hub of, it was a hub of alternative culture um, where people would get things like patches and studded belts and posters and things like that. Um, and it sadly burnt down a few years ago with the, the guy who ran it inside. Um, so the this set of, uh, I did a set of these um, where I'm kind of not in control um, anymore. So usually I know what's happened at the sites and the viewer doesn't. Um, there'll be indications in the titling that, that you might be able to figure out what's happened or you might read the gallery um, sheet or whatever to find out what's happened. With these, I don't know what's happened either. We all know that someone's died and we don't know how or who. Um, I did a PhD that I've just finished. This is about the Ashington Group, um, who are a, a group of mine workers in the um, in Ashington, which is about 15, mil, 15 miles north of Newcastle. Um, in the 30s, they made paintings like this. They were quite um, famous for a few years, um, around the 30s to the 50s mainly. Um, and I made I, I started a PhD to look at them as an artist. Um, there's really only one book about them. The permanent collection of their work is in, uh, is in Woodhall Museum in Ashington on permanent, um, on permanent exhibition. Um, the story of the Ashington Group is very much about these kind of good working class lads who made these paintings of their own lives um, and uh, you know, did a full day down the pit and then went home and painted in part, you know, that's that's true, but I was interested in how they actually made paintings and I was actually interested in um, Ashington as a as a place that, um, like many, many places in in the country, um, only exists for mining. It existed for a, a particular time. It was built for the pits. Now the pits aren't there anymore. Um, what is it? So the paintings kind of tried to explore that a little bit. And again, the idea of walking became quite important. So I took walks from where certain members of the Ashenden group lived to their, their work, um, which is one of five pits around South East Northumberland. Um, and these paintings are all quite small. They're all for, um, 70 by 50 centimeters and they're all on panel, which was, um, it's kind of an average of the size of the paintings that the Ashenden group made. Um, and on panel because the Ashton group worked on panel. So I'm trying to kind of um, not be uh, slavishly um, beholden to the Ashton group, but to make work that um, tips a hat to them. And there's still the idea of history um, with them. So there's a conversation with the Ashton group's work. This uh, painting, for instance, is that site uh, as it is now, just over the road from Asda, um, if anyone's wondering. Um, again, going quite quickly, that's actually at Woodhorn and in Woodhorn's collection now. Um, this painting is on the site of Ashington Colliery, which did look like that. Now it looks like that. Um, so going forward, um, it, was, it was a really intense undertaking doing the PhD and making work that was very specifically thematic. Um, I kind of continued um, on with this uh, making work about um, sites of some kind of importance. Um, this, I saw, I've done a, a lot of New York and uh, Paris and uh, Berlin paintings now. So this is a New York painting. It's where the Ramones stood on the front cover of their eponymous debut record. Um, this painting is another New York one. This is where Neil Young was on the front cover to um, uh, After the Gold Rush. This is uh, where Marilyn Monroe stood um, for that image. Um, technically not for that image uh, because that was on a stage set. Uh, yeah, 
quite interesting how there was a lot of falsification around it. Um, yeah, that's how it really looked and not how it looked in the film. Uh, this is the Chelsea Hotel. Um, actually, this painting is on exhibition at the Biscuit Factory, which is obviously just around the corner from Chili Studios at the minute, so you can see it for free. Um, this is the Chelsea Hotel in, in New York, which was and remains a really iconic place where artists and dilettantes, musicians, um, thinkers would hang out. Um, but it's also you've got dark history as well. It's where uh, the Sex Pistol Sid killed his uh, Mrs. Nancy, allegedly, room 101. Um, this is in Paris. The five horizontal stripes that are slightly beige in colour on this um, were where one of the guillotines stood. So they've left these um, stones inset into the road. Um, you can see them there. That used to be a prison. And yeah, they've built houses around them. This is the Pupin Physics Laboratory in, um, in New York um, at Columbia University, which is also where the, the university where the Ghostbusters uh, had their office um, before they got kicked out of it at the beginning. This is also um, the reason I chose it is where the Manhattan Project was based. So absolutely pivotal in the development of atomic weapons, looks like that, and resulted in that. Um, this is in Gdansk in uh, Poland. This is the exact site where the first battle of World War II took place, an alternative view of it. Um, it's a port um, and it was where the first German strikes of World War II happened. Um, mentioned earlier, I'm from Hartlepool. Uh, this is uh, a kind of reply to this painting in Hartlepool's permanent collection about the bombardment of the Hartlepools, um, which was a uh, um, some airstrikes in the First World War, uh, where the first man to be killed in, in combat on the uh, on British soil in the First World War was killed. Uh, that happened there. That's in the collection of Hartlepool Art Gallery now. Um, this is in Berlin. Um, this is the site of um, Tempelhof Airport, uh, which was requisitioned by the Nazis in uh, the Second World War. Um, this is built by the, by the Nazis, but uh, there used to be a concentration camp there on this site called Columbia House. And it was an extra layer of kind of poignancy. When I went there to visit, um, it was actually being used for Syrian refugees. So these refugees had been um, housed on the exact site where a concentration camp used to be, which gave me chills a little bit. Uh, that's just a little detail of uh, what the paintings look like up close. You see they, they do look quite photographic, but then when you see them there's stuff going on with the paint. Bang up to date, um, in the first lockdown um, I started noticing people posting pictures online of uh, these benches that were taped up um, so you couldn't use them. And um, I couldn't use my studio because that was locked up. So I decided to make uh, small watercolors that I could make at home of these, um, of these images. People were sending them to me from all over the world. Um, and it was such a, a simple act, uh, this idea of taping up these benches, but it was quite lyrical as well. How the, um, the workers who'd wrapped the benches did them, did them in different ways, how people were tearing them down, um, how they, um, the people who were wrapping them were kind of responding to the, the way that the benches were built. Um, and I did a lot of these. Um, I did uh, 40, but then did some to commission as well. And I, I did a, um, a Kickstarter. People started asking me if I was going to do a book. I said, well, I don't really know how to do a book. How do I do that? Um, so I did a, quick, a Kickstarter campaign to crowdfund the production of a book, uh, which you can buy from my website. Please do. I've got loads of them. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that uh, turned into this book with an essay by Michael Smith. Um, yeah, people sent me lots of images. And uh, these paintings, right bang up to date, um, I decided the images were kind of too, it didn't felt like that work was, was over. Um, so people were, people were kind of still wanting to see them. So I, I've made um, so far these two um, larger 
um, acrylic, more resolved versions of those paintings. Um, these are 70 by 100 centimeters on uh, on plywood panels, as are the the rest of my main work as since the kind of New York paintings. Um, these are going to be uh, this one is going to be in Sunderland Museum and Winter Gardens um, in September, and this one will be at the Auxiliary Gallery in Middlesbrough as part of Middlesbrough Art Weekend uh, um, in October, possibly. Uh, and that's that. Follow me on the socials. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing um, and happy to answer some questions. Do feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you so much, Narby. That was amazing and quite intense. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, has anyone got any burning questions? We've got a few on chat. Okay, I'll go to the chat ones. Um, it's from Andy. Was focusing on sites of popular interest a compromise with a predominant focus on documenting the immediately mundane? Uh, good question. Um, I think, I don't think it was a compromise. I think those things are both. Um, I think whether, um, I think a good example of this is kind of how news organizations, you know, ITV and BBC and, and whatever, have people stationed all over the world and like living all over the world, just in case anything happens. Um, and the, the first thing that, um, that happens when an event happens is they, they send a reporter there and the re reporter stands in front of where it happened with a microphone. And I find that kind of fascinating. Like the, the lump of concrete is still a lump of concrete and it's still as every day as any other lump of concrete. It just happens to have had this extra transformational thing that bears no kind of visual witness in a lot of cases to, um, to what it's witnessed. And I think that um, I find that really, really interesting. Um, as I mentioned with the Jack the Ripper things, there's so many, they're a, a really good example of people using those spaces uh, for particular purposes. So office workers having their lunch in this sort of quiet um, courtyard and perhaps not knowing that uh, 125 years ago there was this brutal murder there. Um, and the the sites, they don't tell you about that. And they're still as every day as they ever are. Um, and the popular interest, it's never that popular. Um, there might be, I, I can't ever remember any situation where I found a site um, and then had to queue up to get a photograph of it. Um, you know, they're, they're largely, the histories of these places are largely kind of hidden by the nature of their everydayness. Um, Does the act of documentation imbue a thing with meaning? Hmm. Perhaps. I think, I think it depends on what you mean by a thing. Um, the act of painting something implies a, an importance or a meaning that's being placed on it purely by the the fact that somebody has had the um, has had the inclination to to make a quite a labour intensive piece of work about it. I, although you know, I think a, a photograph of something could similarly do that. Um, good question. Don't know. <laughs> just when you painted the bin you said you didn't really know you didn't have much of a plan for painting something so you did a bin um, ah yeah okay I see what you mean and uh, yeah that okay yeah I get what you mean yeah. that, that sort of uh, that sort of theme in your oeuvre sort of continued but then evolved yeah yeah um, yeah I see what you mean there um, yeah I think the choice of of the bin was quite different at the time. Um, it was more or less kind of rebellious. Was being yeah, it was being intentionally provocative. Yeah, um, 
and yeah, just thinking about what is the, you know, I, I found it funny that, um, you know, potentially kind of hoity-toity people at a white wall gallery um, preview sipping uh, fizzy wine might be uh, just having to focus on this this bin. I, I quite like the um, the kind of really firstness of it, if that makes sense. Um, the but yeah, themes of the everyday have always been kind of interesting to me um, from a very young age. I think being brought up in a in a house where Steptoe and Son and um, Tony Hancock and um, things like Kez and Kitchen Sink Realism were frequently on the TV um, and not only highbrow things, you know, kind of only fools and horses and things like that. I think it, I, I've always been interested in uh, making work that shows the world that I see um, from quite a young age. Yeah. I think for me, a lot of your work, um, I think anyone could identify with it because um, it is the everyday. It's those, it's almost those moments where you stop, and, I don't know, kind of check your phone or, or have a drink or when you're standing there waiting for the bus. But you've imbued lots of meaning behind it as well. Your earlier stuff, sorry, I'm not sure where I'm going with this. <laughs> your earlier stuff, um, did, you, did you have personal narratives as well? Did you construct things behind? Yeah, um, so the, the early stuff, like the, the stuff at uni was, um, yeah, there were quite personal stories behind some of it, but um, not necessarily anything kind of big or, you know, heavy or anything like that. Um, and a lot of it was driven by um, uh, practical kind of visual things as well, like there were those garages that I showed earlier on. Um, it was as simple as I like the green with the uh, with the bin. Like there was, there's always a kind of uh, an, uh, a way to challenge my own um, habits as a painter. So with the bin, um, I remember when I was painting that. Um, the, you know, you you can tell that type the type of plastic that that bin's made from. It's um, it's opaque and it's heavy. Um, I decided to. Uh, deliberately paint it not like that. I did, decided to deliberately paint it very transparent and very kind of um, ethereal almost um, in, in some of the handlings. Um, so there, there's usually a reason, um, but yeah, it was 20 years ago. I can't really remember. <laughs> the, the strength of your uh, paintings to me looks like the composition and the relationship of the shapes to one another and um, did you have any knowledge of that before you, you started painting or is that just sort of um, a thing that you do? So I see the, um, I see the process of taking the, the photograph um, as analogous to drawing. Um, it's all, I think, regardless of what kind of work we make, whether we're making, uh, regardless of what any type of kind of 2D work we make, I should say, where we're doing the same thing. We're filling a rectangle or we're filling a square. Um, and I mentioned earlier that I kind of see myself as an abstract painter um, who happens to paint representational things. So that uh, process of filling the viewfinder of the camera is the first stage where I, I'm thinking of these, exactly what you, those concerns that you've just mentioned. So I'm thinking of how I divide things and frequently thinking about doing something wrong uh, in inverted commas. So ignoring things like, um, or deliberately flying in the face of things like uh, rules of the rule of three for harmonious composition. Um, things like, um, I'll deliberately do things like divide um, compositions in half, which is a, a big design no-no. Um, and I'll deliberately, so like the, the, the red gate painting that I showed earlier on, the four panels of that gate are mathematically in the center of that composition. So it's it's quite a, a confrontational composition in a lot of ways. That green garage is one, again, completely in half. The uh, seal seesaw thing, completely in half. Um, and I think I'm, I'm interested in the idea of how far I can push doing something wrong um, and still have it um, hold together as a work. I want to have something, um, I want there to be a, a sense that 
I suppose it's a, it's a way for me to give the viewer a sense that something might not be just as you expect, but it not to be completely explicit why that is. So that design, that sort of awkwardness is, is literally designed into the painting. Um, would people get that if they weren't comparing your art to other art? Um, I don't know. Um, if they do, fantastic. If they don't, it, you know, it might be, I think the idea of the, doing that compositionally is that is almost that they don't get it. Um, it's almost that somehow you might catch, a, you know, you could be looking at this thing and um, there'll be something that in a very subtle way, almost in a subconscious way, there's something affecting how you, um, how you might consume the image, um, but it might not be evident. And I hope it isn't evident um, exactly what it is. Okay, thank you. Janie, did you have a question there? Did you put your hand up? <laughs> no, I'm just kind of pondering things. <laughs> so it's not really a question. It's more kind of looking at the paintings and seeing the absence of people, but feeling the presence of ghosts. And mm. in the last three paintings, uh, pre-COVID, the memorial paintings, where mm. it's an unidentified ghost, if, if that will continue in looking at at spaces that have significance but aren't identified as much as previous work. That probably doesn't make mm. sense, but not a worry. <laughs> no, I get you. Um, I'm not sure if I'll do uh, any more memorial flowers. Um, that feels like it It might be over, but I, the, I think the, the, the idea of not putting people in them was, you know, that's very, very deliberate. I think as soon as you mm. put a person in a painting, then we as the viewer um, become observers. Um, it becomes about the figures relationship with that landscape. Um, and without figures, then the viewer is kind of more of a participant. Um, you're, you're kind of, you're not observing the actor on the stage. There's a potential, excuse me, for you to be that actor on the stage. Um, I think in terms of, um, there's something I've always kind of struggled with a little bit is how much to give away and how to give it away. Um, so, you know, I went through and I told you all exactly why I chose those things. And if when you see the, the work in a gallery, it's not always that evident. In fact, it's never evident mm -hmm. at all. Um, it's never explicit, sorry. It, it can be evident, but not explicit. Mm -hmm. um, you would have to look at the title and potentially get what it might be from the title or potentially go off and pick up the, the, the gallery sheet to get any kind of um, idea of what the provenance of the site is um, and so it's important that first and foremost that they they function as paintings um, irrespective of any knowledge of the of what might have happened there yeah I was wondering if you could chat more about the effect of um, awards and recognition of your work and how that's mm. supported you it's an odd one really it's you know, i think when you certainly when you're at um at university or whatever and you you see you look at kind of books about artists and you see these um lines in the the bit in, at the back you know you see the same kind of shows named and things like that um and it feels a little bit like a, a closed um system um it feels like you know you're very much outside it um and now i'm kind of at a stage where i've got some of those lines on my cv and i don't know maybe it's imposter syndrome or whatever i don't feel any different um, and the you know every everything is still one thing to the next and it it certainly raised my um profile um i think people um you know, people had heard of me, which was really weird. Um, I think so much about being an artist is uh, it's a very solitary pursuit. You know, it's you uh, on your own standing in front of a wall, um, making these very prosaic decisions, making these, um, you know, it, whilst, uh, I don't know, I, I think my, 
my understanding or my uh, impression about what being a successful artist has completely changed in that 20 years since I was at uni, you know. Um, I remember thinking back then, uh, you know, you'd be at a, a preview every night, quaffing champagne, and then uh, Saatchi would come knocking and uh, fly to New York and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, as you do it more, you realise that being a successful artist is that you're still doing it. Um, because you know like look at our year at uni joe like i can probably not have to use many more than two hands to to think of people who are still doing it um and prizes and and accolades and all that are nice and they help but i think if you know you're always thinking about the next thing and um when i'm in the studio i'm thinking about how to make that um, that bit of red work next to that bit of raw umber. I'm not thinking about, uh, I won the Contemporary British Painter Prize in 2017 and Tim Marlowe's got one of my paintings. I, I'm not thinking about that. I'm just thinking about kind of, oh, I've let the paint dry on that brush. That's going to cost me a fiver. You know, it's, gonna, it's, all, it's all very practical for me. I've realised we've gone over time a bit. Um, was there any other questions or queries people would like to ask? My first question was uh, for you personally, what is art for? Oh yeah, I saw that. Haven't got a clue. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Fair enough. If there's nothing else, uh, just again, massive thanks, Narby, for joining us and uh, letting us into your world. Uh, your thoughts and your process of yeah really amazing. thanks for having me thank you thank you thank you, um, thank you very have much. a day everyone catch up bye -bye. soon bye. thanks again bye.